The ShapeOco 4 draws from many of the improvements we developed with the ShapeOco Pro. It takes the affordable, time-tested technologies of the ShapeOco 3 and marries them with the sturdier architecture of the hybrid table system. And, just like the ShapeOco Pro, the ShapeOco 4 goes together faster and more easily than the ShapeOco 3. In this video, I'll be providing an overview of the assembly process for the ShapeOco 4 XXL. The steps to build all ShapeOco 4s are basically identical, the only differences will be in the lengths of rails and sheet metal components, as well as quantities of hardware provided. The ShapeOco in this video is a pre-production model, and the changes that you'll see compared to the production machines that will be shipping out of Illinois are largely cosmetic. We'll make note of any important differences between the two versions in this video. If there are any updates to the assembly procedure that aren't captured in this video, they will be listed in the description section of this video below. With those ground rules established, let's get to building. When you get your ShapeOco 4, it will arrive in carefully designed packaging. Each box inside the protective outer shell is a self-contained step for assembling your machine. They should be opened one at a time as you get to the corresponding step. This lets you focus on one thing at a time, reducing the chance that you might misplace a part and minimizing workspace clutter. The first step is to lay out the frame of the ShapeOco 4. In the corresponding box for this step, you'll find machined extrusions, sheet metal drag chain side supports, hardware, some zip ties, and the tools you'll need for assembly. The extruded cross members form the foundation of the ShapeOco frame. Lay them out about a foot apart on your workbench with the standoffs facing upwards. To prevent damage during transit, some of the tubes may need standoffs installed at the time of assembly. The sheet metal panels that also came in this box are the shrouds that will support the Y-axis drag chains. There are two distinctive threaded holes in each panel which will tell you the orientation that the panel should be mounted in. These two are for mounting the drag chains and there are two trailing holes behind it for the cable anchors that should point towards the back of the machine. Screw these wings to the outer edges of the table's cross members, but keep the button head cap screws loose. I like to tighten them, then back off by a quarter turn. These drag chain wings will roughly establish the spacing between the cross members, but we don't want to lock in the position of the frame components until we've squared the machine in a later step. The controller mounting bracket is also included in the box for the first step, and you can optionally install it now, but it doesn't need to be installed until step 9 where you mount the controller enclosure. You may find it easier to work around the machine without it present. Step 2 is to attach the Y-axis rails. In this box, you'll find aluminum extrusions as well as some hardware. There will also be two strips of metal that are the side skirts for the Y-axis rails to block dust from getting under them. Set these aside, they will be installed in the next step. The V-groove on the extruded rails will be on the outside of the machine, keeping your V-wheels further away from the dust generated during machining. The Y-rails are secured to the standoffs on the hybrid table cross members with custom shoulder bolts. Linking the Y-axis extrusions to the table in this manner ties the whole structure together, making the whole frame stronger and more rigid. When attaching the rails with the shoulder bolts, leave them loose by about a quarter turn. Squaring the machine will come at a later step, and we don't want to lock in the shape of the frame right now. Step 3 is to install the X-axis gantry on this machine, but it's also inextricably linked to step 4, which is installing the Y-axis end plates. The eccentric nuts installed on all the carriage plates should be in the 6 o'clock position so that the V-wheels are as far apart as possible. Roll the gantry onto the Y-axis extrusions so that the V-wheels on the gantry's end plates are resting on the V-rails. For this step, you should take your time and not force anything. You don't want the sharp ends of the rail gouging your V-wheels. Once the gantry is in place, you should screw the end plates onto the end of the Y-axis rails. This will enable you to square your frame, but perhaps more importantly, prevent your gantry from accidentally rolling off the far end of the rails. The end plate with the power button goes on the front right corner, the end plate with a proximity switch attached to it is for the back right corner. Each end plate is secured with four screws and can be fully tightened down at this time. There is an extension cable for the power switch in the box that can be connected at this time, but in step 9, once everything is plugged into the controller, we'll come back and do some cable management to make sure that this extension stays outside of where the gantry will run. A quick aside about squaring your ShapeOco, no matter how you assemble the hybrid table, the Y rails will be parallel. The shoulder bolts that secure the Y rails to the hybrid table will center them to the machined holes on the cross tubes below, enforcing a consistent spacing. So in theory, this frame could be a parallelogram, but never a trapezoid. The relative position of the Y-axis rails has nothing to do with how square your machine cuts. That is entirely dependent on your gantry. As long as the carriage plates at the ends of the gantry sit perpendicular to the long axis of the X extrusion, then the gantry will settle out to be perpendicular to the Y-axis rails. 
the ends of all of our extrusions are cut on our vertical machining centers, which means that your Shapoko's x-axis should be as perpendicular to the y-axis as it is on the industrial CNC's we use to make them. Regardless of whether or not the gantry touches the end plate symmetrically, the squareness of your cuts will not be affected. That is more of a cosmetic issue than a practical one unless the homing switch, which is on the back right corner, cannot be reached. Still, for our collective sanity, I'm sure we would all like to minimize gaps as much as possible. So this is why we recommend rolling the gantry to one end of the y-axis as reference for squaring the frame. The hybrid table hardware needs to be loose for this step so that the rail positions can be adjusted. Nudge the corners of the hybrid table frame to eliminate any parallelogramming of the hybrid table relative to the gantry. Once you have the frame squared up so that the end plates are within about a millimeter or so of the gantry's end plates, start slowly tightening up the shoulder bolts holding the Y rails to the hybrid table cross beams. If you accidentally tweak the frame while torquing down the shoulder bolts, you can nudge the corner of your frame in their partially tightened state to get the end plates back in contact with the gantry just before you fully tighten the shoulder bolts. Once this is done, you can tighten down the rest of the hardware on the hybrid table. This process will ensure you have a complete self-contained machine that gives you the maximum advertised travel and will basically remain square until the end of time. With the gantry squared up, now is a good time to get the x-axis carrier plate mounted and your v-wheels sorted out. With the two bottom v-wheels removed, hang the x-axis carrier plate on the gantry. Then, install the lower v-wheels, making sure that there's still a washer between the wheel bearing and the plate. Loosely tighten the M5 screws holding these in place. On both the X and Y axes, rotate the eccentric nuts clockwise just until the V-wheels grab the rails. On the Y axis, it may be necessary to crack the button head screws holding the V-wheels loose just a tiny bit in order to more freely rotate the eccentric nut. I like to keep a finger on the V-wheel and spin it as I tighten the eccentric nut clockwise. When it starts to become harder, but not impossible, to freely spin that V-wheel without the whole carriage moving, then that's about when you should stop. If you overzealously crush the V-wheels against the extrusions, then the wheels could develop flat spots when the machine is sitting for prolonged periods, as well as create excessive rolling resistance that reduces the performance and accuracy of your machine. Your X and Y axes should both roll freely at this point. When you have the V-wheels making good contact with the rails, you can then give that M5 button head screw a twist to snug everything back up and lock the eccentric nuts in position. Once you're done with the V-wheels, we can install the side skirts from step 2 that will prevent dust from fouling the lower V-wheels. These bolt onto the end plates on the Y rails. We can then run the GT2 belts for the Y axis. Using the belt anchors that have three slots in them, fasten one side of a belt to an end plate. Then, feed the belt under the idler pulleys and use a small hex key if you need to in order to fish that belt up and over the pulley on the stepper motor shaft. On the opposite end plate, feed through enough GT2 belts so that the belt anchor just barely engages with the included M5 fastener. Maintain downward pressure on the anchor until it's firmly pulled against the end plate. Otherwise, the belt may loosen and slip back through the anchor. You should not substitute your own M5 socket head screw in this step. We only want to pull the belt anchor about 2 to 3 millimeters. If you use a longer screw, you may overstretch the belt and or damage the stepper motor. On the Y-axis, there is an optional M3 screw you can use with the belt clips to hold them flat and ensure that they do not rotate and interfere with the V-wheels. The X-axis gantry has a drag chain support which can be attached after you mount on a set of cable tie anchors underneath. These anchors will hold an extension cable to connect the left side stepper motor to the controller. This drag chain support attaches to the top of the X-axis gantry with countersunk M3 fasteners. On the X-axis carrier plate, there are brackets for mounting the ends of the data and router drag chains, which will be done in later steps. The shorter one goes on the left side of the axis, or the right side when viewed from behind. The bent end that sits against the carrier plate should face downwards. Step 5 is to attach the Z-axis to the gantry. In this box, you'll find the Z-plus assembly. There are six button head screws that secure the Z-axis to the X-axis carrier plate. Once this is installed, you can route the X-axis GT2 belt and mount the stepper motor. The stepper motor should be installed after you fish the GT2 belt through the idler pulleys since there's no way to do that once the stepper motor is installed. After the GT2 belt has been run through the XZ carriage assembly and the stepper motor is secure, you can finish tensioning the belt with the included anchors. Step 6 is to install the drag chains for the stepper motors and homing switches. There are two drag chains in this box that come pre-run with the necessary cables. The longer one with three cables is for the X-axis, and the shorter drag chain will go on the Y-axis. 
The x-axis drag chain begins on the left side of the bracket on the XZ carriage, goes out to the left before looping back around to terminate on the right side of the machine. When you install this drag chain, take note of the gender of the connectors. The stepper motors and Z limit switch will only plug into the extension cables one way. On the right side, there is an L-shaped bracket for handling the transition of the wiring bundle from X to Y. This bracket installs with two button head screws. There are two holes at the bottom of this bracket for attaching the Y-axis drag chain. You may find it easier to attach the transition bracket to the Y-axis drag chain before mounting it on the gantry so you're not trying to do everything upside down. Note that at the gantry, the cables in the Y-axis drag chain should exit before the end of the drag chain. This is to eliminate the possibility of them getting pinched against the rear end plate. The other end of the Y-axis drag chain connects to the black support panel that we installed on step 1. You can then further clean up the wiring with cable tie anchors. When you have all the components secure, you can then connect all the extension cables which are labeled. Step 7 is to install the router, its mount, and drag chains. First up, the router mount. The Shapeoko 4 uses the same new 65mm mount that attaches to the Z carrier plate with four screws. There are two M6s at the top and two M5s at the bottom corners. These screws are independent from the ones used for clamping the mount shut, which means that you can tram the mount without loosening your router or spindle. However, I'm going to install the router a little later so I can keep plenty of slack in the power cord while I deal with the drag chains. You'll need to run the router's power cord through the drag chains. The easiest way to open up the drag chains is to pry the cover off each segment at one end of the link using the next link for leverage and working your way to the end. Lay the power cord through the opened drag chain and then snap the links closed. Run the power cord for the router through both the X and Y axis drag chains. On the left side of the gantry, you'll install another L-shaped transition bracket. On the Y axis drag chains, you'll need to remove one of the linkage covers and pop the tailpiece off so you can pass the power cord out through the drag chain before the end. Again, this is to eliminate any risk of cords getting pinched against the end plate when the gantry slides backwards. The Carbide Compact Router comes with an extra long power cord specifically for use on CNCs like the XXL. If you purchased a different router separately for the Shapeoko, you may need to use an extension cord to get power to your router. Alright, back to the router mount. If your mount is a little too snug for the router, the center hole in the front is for a grub screw that will push the two sides of the mount apart, creating a fraction of a millimeter of extra clearance and sparing you from the angst of using a screwdriver to pry apart the mount and possibly damaging the anodized finish. Once the router is seated in the mount, be sure to back out that grub screw before using two M6 screws to tighten up the mount. Otherwise, that grub screw will interfere with the clamping action of the mount. You should remove and set aside the grub screw until the next time you need to adjust the spindle, as it may rattle loose during machining and be lost forever to the ether or your dust collector. Step 8 is the heaviest box by far, and it contains the hybrid table extrusions and MDF slats. One thing to note is that the latest version of our hybrid table does not use a plastic filler strip to prevent things from falling under the table. The extrusion has simply been designed wider to fill that gap. The MDF slats for the hybrid table ship nestled in the aluminum extrusions for protection, but we won't be needing them just yet. Set the MDF aside and lay out the aluminum extrusions across the frame going front to back. Use the countersunk hardware to fasten the extrusions to the frame. If you opt to use power tools for this step, make sure you set the clutch to a lower setting. It's very easy to cross-thread these screws since they're so short. If you use an impact driver, you will almost certainly end up stripping a hole. I like to first install fasteners in two holes as far apart as possible or practical, since the countersunk screws will try to influence the alignment of the extrusions. That should bring the rest of the holes in line. When you're done, tighten the countersunk screws by hand. Now you can throw the MDF slats onto the hybrid table and secure them with socket head screws. Step 9 is to install the electronics and apply the finishing touches. The electronics enclosure goes on the right side of the machine with power and USB connectors pointing backwards. After you get the controller enclosure installed, there is a green grounding wire that you should attach to the frame through one of the M6 screws holding down that mounting bracket. Now you can plug in the stepper motors and switches into the controller. You'll have three homing switches, four stepper motors, and a power switch to connect. The right Y-axis stepper motor should go to the Y1 connector on the board. If you have a bit setter, now is a good time to plug it in as well. The power switch extension cable and the bit setter cord should be zip tied to anchors running between the moving gantry and the inside of the drag chain. At this point, the machine is mechanically ready to run, but before you do anything, you should flash the appropriate settings to the controller and configure carbide motion correctly for your size Shapeoko. 
power on the machine and in carbide create on your computer, hit connect, but do not hit initialize. We don't want the shape oco to start moving yet. Go to the settings panel, hit send configuration data and select shape oco 4. It'll take a couple seconds for carbide motion to transmit the necessary parameters to the shape oco. Next, in the Travel Dimensions section of the settings, hit the Load Defaults button and select Shape Oco 4 XXL. Hit OK on the pop-up and hit OK on the Settings panel. The Travel Dimensions will not be saved unless you hit OK in the bottom right corner. Now, you can home the machine and start jogging it around. If you have any issues with homing, check to make sure that your homing switches are working and positioned correctly to pick up the axes. If a homing switch is working properly, it will light up when you touch a piece of metal to the face of it, and if the switch is connected properly and the control board is detecting it, a light on the board will illuminate and the detected input will be shown in the carbide motion settings window. If you have an issue with homing, check to make sure that all your switches are working. One of them may need to be moved closer to an axis in order to detect it. If you bought a bit setter, which would be installed on the front right end plate, you'll want to get that set up next. Go into the jogging interface and position the machine so that the router is just above the bit setter button. Having a quarter inch dowel in the collet would be helpful at this stage. Then go into the settings menu. If you have a pop-up about the zero position not being set, just click to ignore that warning and don't set your zero. That really doesn't matter right now because we aren't machining anything. In settings, select the checkbox to enable the use of the bit setter and then hit use current location. Carbide Motion will ask you to reinitialize the machine and measure a tool. Once that runs, you're ready to go. We hope you guys enjoy using the Shape Oco 4. If you run into any issues setting up your CNC, feel free to reach out to our support team. We're here to help and we want the process of building, learning, and using a CNC to be as straightforward and pain-free as possible. Until the next video, good luck and have fun machining, folks.